Yeah, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before the break, we uh, we began studying chapter six, where we're talking about as kingdom builders, uh, our kingdom building is all about building people and building them by the um, spirit. And a good example of uh, kingdom building uh, or a good to, uh, 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 a good kingdom builder, a life that we can see and imitate and learn from. Uh, one of them is Apostle Paul. So, you know, um, we see that, you know, when Apostle Paul ministered or he went about building uh, God's kingdom, we see that, you know, he um, treasured and valued people dearly, okay? Um, and that is why we see, you know, him writing those letters to the churches because he was concerned about people, the doctrines, the things they were following, what they were doing in the church. There should be some kind of order, you know. So he was more interested in people, uh, in addressing their needs and helping them in spiritual growth and how to build God's uh, kingdom. And so he is, uh, you know, so much involved in building people that he says, you know, in First Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse three, that he is, not, he is willing not only to live but is also willing to die together with them okay uh, the book of romans um, you know paul is so worried about his own people the jews because they are not uh, uh, believing jesus christ as uh, the messiah or the true and living god and he's saying that you know um, he's even willing to uh, go to hell you know um, if his people are his jews the jewish people will be uh, saved and accept jesus christ so much so that even as he's called as an apostle to the gentiles he was so burdened for his own people the uh, jews okay uh, in first Thess thessalonians chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 look at what paul says can somebody read that please for what is our hope or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. So here when Paul stands before God, you know, on that final day, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he's saying he won't boast about the number of churches he planted, the number of people he mentored, you know, the number of missionary journeys he went on, the people, number of people who were saved, who accepted Christ. But what does he say? He says, who is his joy, his crown, his glory? What, he, what will he celebrate and boast about? The people. Yes, the people that he served. Okay. And um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 uh, to 3, uh, Paul very clearly says that, you know, people are his epistles written in his heart. Okay. People are his epistles written in his heart, known and read by all men. That means his life was so transparent before people that everyone knew him. And, uh, you know, was able to imbibe his lifestyle, his way of living, was able to see his life very clearly. And he says that, you know, uh, you are an epistle written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living stone. And he says, you're a hep epistle written in our hearts. So what is he meaning to say? Who's Who are the people in our hearts? Huh? Yeah, I'm sure that I'm not in some of your hearts, right? Because I'm not, yeah, it's, I mean, as simple as that. I mean, I am your teacher, but then it's not that you hold me so dear in your heart, okay? It's, uh, you have your own, you know, very close people that you love, who are very close to you, uh, 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 who, who are in your heart, okay? So we carry them in our heart. So for Paul, you know, who was in his heart, the people that he minister to the people that he uh, served and he says they are written in his heart and how are they written by the enabling of the holy spirit he says not by ink what does it mean not by ink you're not written by ink means <laughs> not by ink means not in carnal ways you know carnal methods 
okay uh, ink is something when you you it's man made you write it it can even you can just put water and can be washed away it's not lasting but he's saying you are written in our hearts by the spirit of the living um, god okay not on tablets of stone but on tablets of flesh that is our heart so you know when we build why is uh, why are we looking at it be uh, this point is because when we have people in our heart when we are burdened about people that god has entrusted to us and we are looking at how we can build them up and strengthen them up and get them to journey with god and get them to spiritually mature then god gives us the authority to speak into their hearts and lives okay so it is when we write them in our hearts and not doing it through carnal methods not saying hey my church i have thousand members just to boast of but you know allowing the holy spirit to work it's the holy spirit who empowers people is the holy spirit who establishes the work of god in the hearts and lives of people it's not our charisma it's not how well we can preach teach the doctrine how much uh, you know how well we can do all of those things all of those are important but it's the holy spirit who ultimately works in the hearts and lives of people okay so it is the work of the holy spirit that brings about transformation and permanent change in the hearts and lives of people so what is what does it mean even as we go about kingdom building we need to be mindful that we are building people and we have to build them not in our own strength in our own independence in our own wisdom in our own smartness our skills but by the work of the holy spirit and not through carnal methods not doing things because you know preaching uh, messages that people will love to hear you know prosperity gospel or grace greater grace you can keep sinning you know god is gracious he's merciful he's forgiving he won't punish you not talking about sin not talking about salvation not talking about heaven hells coming of god judgment you know we don't talk all, all of those things because we don't want people to leave our church and go we want people to stay we favor the rich the business people the business uh, uh, the higher society class even if they do things that are wrong we don't talk about it or don't, don't uh, correct them because we don't want them to leave our church because we want money you know we want uh, uh, to know the, our church to be known fa be famous and to know that the big people are coming to our church or being part of our ministry okay so that is all carnal methods but we need to build people by the spirit okay and god uses us you know uh, to build people and that does not mean because god uses us uh, to raise up or mentor people or be uh, spiritually help people to grow and transform in their lives it does not mean that we become gods right it does not mean that we are perfect it does not mean we are great it's only that god's anointing or the work of the holy spirit is flowing in and through us and god is using us and is the holy spirit working in the lives of people so god uses us as imperfect people to perfect imperfect people so never come to that place where we think uh, it's all about us it's all our doing it's all our smartness it's all how good we are but we need to remember that we are imperfect and god is using us to perfect other people who are imperfect okay now some practical keys to building the people by the spirit the first one is to recognize that god, god's purpose for the individual okay so even as we go about ministering to people and building people we need to understand or recognize what is god's purpose for their life we need to discern how do we discern this the help of the holy spirit yes so we need to discern what is uh, god's calling in that person's life what is their function how do we know what is their function their talents and their gifts okay and the grace that they have to fulfill that so we need to help people to fulfill and to come or position themselves in such a way that they can fulfill god's purpose for their lives okay and uh, this is a great responsibility that we have we're greatly accountable to god so we need the help of the holy spirit uh, look at jesus you know through the uh, power of the holy spirit he was able to discern when he saw people right when he saw peter what does he say in john chapter 1 verses 14 and uh, 20 uh, 40 41 and 42 
you know, um, can somebody read that? John chapter 1, 41 and 42. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is Cephas, which okay. is translated as stone. Yes. So, you know, Jesus speaks uh, his de destiny for, speaks into the divine destiny for Simon. Okay, here. And how does he do it? Through the discerning of the Holy Spirit. Okay. In the case of Nathaniel, when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him, what does he say? Here is a man who in him there is no deceit. Okay. So here we see that, you know, uh, Jesus speaking divine destiny into the, into the hearts and lives of these uh, people, calling them out from where they are to where God has purposed them to be. So also, even as we build people, you know, God will get us to speak into their hearts and in their lives. Is it possible? Is it possible? That God will get us to speak into their hearts and lives, speak divine destinies in the hearts and lives? Yes, when? We genuinely rely on the Holy Spirit. We, when we have uh, people written on our hearts, when we genuinely care and love them. Okay, genuine love and care for people. Okay, so that is what helps us. And we see that uh, Jesus had genuine love for people. The reason why he came was for what? For us, for people, to save people. Okay, uh, to search for the lost and to find the lost and to save them. Okay, so when we have people written in our hearts, God would help us to speak into their hearts and lives. I remember when, you know, when uh, in children's church, you know, ministering in children's church, I used to tell uh, our teachers to uh, spend time, you know, um, praying for uh, the children in their class. So suppose that there are two teachers for each class at Central and they have six children. So each of you take three, three and pray. And I remember when I was teaching the 10th grade and uh, along with my co-teacher, we used to pray on the sa at the same time, same day in different places, uh, not meet and pray or uh, all of those things. But, you know, God used to really reveal some of the things that these children were going through in, in our class and some and just telling them and just speaking into their hearts and lives was really, you know, they were really... Um, they would really sense, oh my gosh, you know, God knows, he, he sees. I remember that, uh, you know, saying, God, every Sunday when I go to children's church, I want you to lay on my heart something that I want to minister to some child personally, saying, hey, this is what God uh, wants to say to you. And I remember saying some of those things to some children and they were just so shocked and so touched. I had one of them um, really was crying, you know, just hug me I was crying and then later on the parent the mother was very uh, worried did auntie Serena say something and so she was uh, you know shouted at her or what and so sent somebody to ask me what really happened so I didn't say what God told me I just told the child because it's very specific to the child but something the child was really going through was really burdened I think so overburdened that the child really didn't bother who was there in adult church just cried just weeping like anything. So, you know, when when we have really that burden, the Holy Spirit really uh, reveals to our hearts and our um, minds, and we can really minister to um, them, okay? Uh, also, we need to position people to release divine potential, okay? Uh, which means, you know, God has a appointed place, a position, a season which people that he gives uh, entrust to us, sheep that he entrusted to us, and we need to develop what God wants to be developed in, in their lives. In the case of uh, Moses, you know, God tells him, you know, uh, encourage Joshua, you know, command Joshua, encourage him, strengthen him, for he is going to lead the people okay so here moses had the responsibility uh, to encourage him strengthen him and build him up in the case of barnabas and saul you know the first 17 years of saul was what is it called the first 17 years of saul quiet period a silent period in paul's life and many of them did not want to associate with paul even though he, he had accepted jesus christ why because they looked at him as the whole 
old Saul, right, who was persecuting and maybe just pretending, you know, to be saved and uh, finding out who are really believers. But we see that Barnabas, you know, um, uh, departed for Tarsus to seek Paul and he found him and brought him to Antioch. So, you know, in, in those silent years, there was not many who engaged with Paul other than Ananias who went and you know, spoke over him and baptized him and laid hands on him when he was blind. And then, you know, we see Barnabas going and also Barnabas goes with Paul on his first missionary uh, journey. But um, and uh, Barnabas takes his um, I think nephew John Mark along with them in the first missionary journey along with Paul. And suddenly John Mark, you know, in um, the middle of the way in the missionary journey in Pamphylia, he says, hey, I don't want to continue with my with this missionary journey. Please leave me. You two go ahead, Barnabas and Paul, and I don't want to continue with you. And Paul was very, very upset. Okay, and uh, in, when they were getting ready to go on the second missionary journey, you know, Barnabas tells uh, Paul, we'll take John Mark. And uh, Paul and Barnabas had such a great disagreement. Paul was saying, no, I don't want to take him. Barnabas was, uh, you know, was very bound on taking uh, John Mark. So much so that they departed ways. You know, Paul took um, Silas and uh, uh, Barnabas took uh, John Mark and went on different um, uh, uh, missionary journeys. But we see that later on, Paul realizes his mistake. He sees how John Mark is, you know, spiritually mature, growing, and how his wonderful work he's doing in the ministry for the Lord and building his kingdom. He takes John Mark uh, uh, again, and he's part of his team. Okay. So, um, we see that, you know, sometimes we can make a mistake in discerning people. We can just look at their outward, you know, face uh, uh, attitude. Sometimes we can't just judge people on their outward appearance, how they behave. You know, some people can be very casual, very jovial, very fun loving. Doesn't mean they're not spiritually inclined or not having an intimacy with God or, you know, um, uh, very friendly, very caring and not you know, we can misjudge them for not being spiritually mature or intimate with God or seeking God or loving God. It's all, you know, uh, some barriers that we place or some things that we look for ourselves. And Paul did that with John Mark, but he realizes his mistake and he corrects his, uh, his mistake and he brings him back into uh, uh, you know, journeying along with him and ministering along with uh, John Mark. So even as we realize divine potential, uh, you know, we need to help people position themselves so that they can be used by God. Okay. And we also help need to help people discover and develop their gifting. Okay. So ministering to people is not just, okay, talking about um, salvation, getting them uh, to know Christ, accept Christ, and then just leaving them, but also getting them to grow into spiritual maturity, getting them to know what is God's plan and purpose for their life, fulfilling God's plan and purpose for their life, and also in the process, developing uh, uh, and helping them identify, discover their um, uh, calling, their gifting, and helping them to move in their gifting and their calling. And that is what Paul did with many of the people that he um, uh, raised us, raised up like, uh, you know, some of them like uh, Timothy, you know, uh, some of them like Onesimus, uh, who was a runaway slave or Philemon, you know, re recognizes his potential and talks about him to um, uh, to Philemon and recommends him back to uh, to uh, Philemon. Okay, so here we need to be mindful of that and also help people know and develop their gifts, their grace, and their function and their callings. Okay, the next one is nurture life to life. Even as we uh, build people up, it's important that people who associate with us are looking at our own lives. Okay, our lives can speak the greatest message. Our lives are the greatest message that we will ever preach. And uh, even before we teach or ask people to do it, we ourselves should be doing it, following it, living that. Okay. And we cannot uh, minister to people. We cannot teach them if we ourselves are not growing in the word of God. If we ourselves are not growing in the word of God, in the revelation, the truths of God, if we ourselves are not growing in the gifts of the spirit, you know, we cannot attempt to teach others and expect them to do. 
okay because it, it won't be possible you cannot give what you do not have okay what you do not have you cannot give anyone okay and you cannot take people to places where you have not been your self okay you cannot teach people about stewardship when you are not a good steward yourself you cannot talk or teach people about being godly in character when you are not godly in character yourself it doesn't mean that hey we don't talk about it we don't teach about it no you know when i teach about it i when i am preparing all of these things you know uh, on a year to year basis there are so many things i say god i have not done this you know i'm so sorry please forgive me you know um, thank you that even as i'm teaching in bible college is not just like hey i have to go and prepare and teach it's about me learning because all of these things which i teach in bible college really helps me it teaches me i am just growing more in my in my faith walk in my spiritual maturity i am learning so many revelations so many truths and it's reminding me of things that i have forgotten so last night i all remember that there is one or two areas when i was preparing that i had fallen short of and i was saying you know i am going back to god and saying god you know i have fallen short in these areas so please help me i think this is so important you know if not uh, i am not going to be an effective minister i am not going to be an effective teacher i am not going to be an effective person in your uh, kingdom so god i have overlooked this i have not been mindful please help me so uh, we cannot take people to places where we have not been and uh, you know uh, what we preach and teach if we are not following it ourselves it will just be a noise you know it will just be an echo we are echoing somebody else's message will be echoing so somebody else's thoughts like for example when we preach on sundays in different locations we all preach the same sermon pass ashi sense but we prepare that but when we are preparing it so many times i am mindful i have fallen short of those things and i am so careful that i before i go and preach and teach i set my life in uh, order and right before god before i go and teach otherwise i'll just be a noise and i the anointing will not flow and people will not be ministered to so that is what i'm looking for i'm saying god even as i spend so much of time preparing a message my whole of saturday goes in just preparing the message and i spend 3 or 4 hours of uh, sorry close to between 5 and 6 hours preparing for each uh, bible college class Uh, I mean the three hours that I do on Monday and Friday. I want that to be profitable, okay. And the only way it's profitable, I can only make a noise if I'm just going to just teach what is there in the content. But if I don't mean it and I'm not doing it in my own life and following that, it's just going to be a noise. It's a waste of my time and my energy. I could have done so many other things. I could have slept. I could have rested. I could have done so many things. But I'm investing so much of my time and energy, God. I want that to be profitable. So please. you know help me in these areas change me in these areas so that what my life and my ministry and what i'm teaching can be useful and profitable okay so uh, you cannot administer liberty in areas where you are held bondage your self so some areas where we are in bondage ourselves we cannot speak release and freedom uh, to others and they cannot be a uh, uh, they cannot be released from those things if we are in bondage our selves because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke it is the anointing that uh, you know releases people from bondage and if we don't have the anointing in that area we can't you know release the anointing to break those bondages and strongholds in other people's lives okay another thing the most Im uh, important thing is avoid insecurities now all of us are insecure we are not perfect people but we need to take a stock of our lives and to see ourselves and to correct ourselves and uh, to work on those things and to move towards christ likeness okay so there are various uh, insecurities that can hinder us from relating to people or ministering or talking or speaking into the lives of people and one of those insecurities is jealousy you know where we are jealous of others others who are doing better than us others who are preaching better than us others who are more famous in the eyes of people uh, some people love some people uh, ministers of god more than the others and the others who are not love can come to a place of jealousy but we need to avoid that uh, an example is saul and david right um, saul king uh, killed thousands and david killed tens of thousands okay and saul became very jealous and what happened led him to 
the rest of his life run behind one man, right? They were like being running and catching uh, the whole of Saul's life. It was so sad. Okay, he lost his whole purpose and plan for his um, life. So it's important that we maintain a pure heart attitude that is right before God. People can see our uh, you know, a show that we put in front of them, but God looks at our heart, and it's important to maintain a pure heart before God, a right heart attitude towards God. Okay, uh, avoid being overprotective and being over controlling over people. Now, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, when people come, you know, God sends people into our lives, whether it's a Bible study group or prayer group or cell group or a church or, you know, some people that we have raised them up, or, uh, we have shared the gospel and they have come to uh, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We kind of be overprotective over them. You know, if they go for some other meetings or they go for some other uh, bible study or they go for some conference that is held by in some other church or uh, some crusade that happens in the city if they go or if they go and help out in some other ministries or tight in some other ministries we get very very upset you know and then we give them all reasons uh, i've heard some people say you know uh, if you don't go to the church service on sunday the next day monday morning morning pastor will be in our house asking us why we did not come to church so we should say we will tell him you know we so i can't come for this program i'm so sorry even though i want to come you know uh, so they become so overprotective they become controlling that you know they control controlling to the sense uh, to the point where they even control who the person should marry, where they should go and get a job, where their children should study, where they should tie it, how much they should tie it, what car they should buy, where they should live their house. We've heard of people who have even told us that, you know, um, men and women of God have told them to sell their houses and come and stay very next to their house. You know, what, where to put their children in schools and all of them are so hurt because of the way their lives have been uh, controlled. And then sometimes when you listen to it, you just think, how can people control your life to every little aspect? It is, it is really so demonic. It is like spiritual witchcraft, you know, that people do uh, by being over controlling and over protective. And they say that they're actually protecting their taking care and protecting their sheep and it's not taking care and it's it's like overprotecting imagine if you have a husband or a, a or a wife or you are parents and you do that with your children every minute to minute you are where did you go what did you do tell me this what did I, how will a child feel how will you feel as a spouse you know i mean it it can be so strangling for you you can be so suffocated you know and that is what uh, happens yes we need to be zealous and jealous of uh, you know the people that god has entrusted to us not and godly jealousy godly jealousy means that yeah you know that they are following the right doctrines they're listening to the right men and women of god they're learning from other men and women of god it's okay but not, not being overprotected that they have to listen only to your sermons, come only to your Bible study, only to your prayer cell, not go anywhere else. That is uh, not a right attitude. That is birth out of insecurity. You're insecure that your people will leave. Now, you shouldn't be insecure because if the person really feels they belong to you, they are family, they will come back. Home, right if your children get angry with you and uh, they go away and they say i'm not coming back they'll, they'll come back home you know because it's their home that is where they belong okay so uh, avoid being overprotective over controlling over involvement you know, some of us so over involvement in who and everything that you know uh, 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 is done in the lives of the people even what things they buy so I remember, you know, a girl was from a non-Christian background and uh, she got married and um, she moved from, uh, she got a husband who was from Bangalore to move to her place where her pastor was and then uh, also moved to the apartment next to the pastor's apartment. And uh, it got so frustrating for that person because she said, hey, let's buy a fridge. She said, I'll go and check with pastor and ask him which fridge to buy. That's when, that's when he 
thought things were really becoming too much and uh, he told her you know uh, we better move back to bangalore my parents are there and she was not willing to do it and you know now it's sadly they're divorced because he was so over controlling over protective uh, this over involvement okay and also be uh, avoid being overly authoritative okay look at what paul uh, peter says in first peter chapter 5 verse 2 can somebody read that please First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and verse 3. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Shepherds the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you but being example to the flock yes so here uh, you know peter is saying you know shepherd the flock not out of compulsion but willingly not as being bosses not being lords but by setting an example look at what paul says in first corinthians he says he preaches the gospel and he presents the gospel to people without charge which means he's saying, hey, I'm not getting any money or benefit from you because he was running his own business, okay? And he says, I don't abuse my authority for the sake of the gospel, okay? And um, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 12, verse 19, he says, we do all things, beloved, for your edification. So he's saying everything that we do, we do it so that people can be edified, okay? And the next one is avoid emotional attachments okay uh, uh yes people are sent by god for us in our lives for a season you know if they want to leave and go or go into some other ministry go to some other church go to some other place start their own ministry you know let them go release them okay because they were there for a certain season okay don't get so emotionally attached to them have soulish attachments that you don't want to leave them and allow them to go into god's plan and purposes for their lives okay the next one is bring correction when required it's important that we correct people but correct them in love okay uh, speak the truth in love ephesians uh, says that you know and um, sometimes you know we don't want to correct people because we think we lose relationships okay but if we think about that we are actually destroying the person because whatever they're doing their sin is causing them more harm okay and so if we ignore that it's going to destroy the person okay and always remember that when you're correcting people that you're correcting the sin the problem and not the person don't condemn the person don't put down the person condemn the sin but not the person okay and um, when you correct the person uh, remember not to keep talking about it again and again back to the same person when they do another mistake and also talking about it too others sometimes we can be very spiritual we can go around and tell people hey please pray for this person they fell in the sin and i corrected them i want you to pray that's actually spiritual gossip the other word for it is not gossip but spiritual gossip okay i think if you and the person prays god can hear you don't need three people to pray for the same thing okay um and when you bring in correction do it for the person's edification and not destruction sometimes we do bring correction that will destroy the person's heart and mind and the way we do that we need to be very very sensitive it breaks the person so much that you know the person doesn't want to do anything with god ultimately and that's very sad okay so bring uh, correction with gentleness okay is it difficult is it easy to bring correction with gentleness sometimes no right sometimes it's because with our emotions, we can get sometimes very angry, right? And then we can, this is flare up or it can show in our in our language, especially some people like me, you know, it just shows everything in my action, in my word, in my body language, in my face, everything. And it's very difficult. So uh, my tone of voice, so people will really misjudge that even if I'm trying to be nice, it will all be misjudged. 
and I'm saying, God, please help me with the, in these areas, you know. So um, we, we must ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be gentle, kind, because that is the fruit of the Spirit, okay. All a um, uh, little difficult, but we can ask God to uh, help us, okay. When we are uh, correcting people, we beseech them and not command them. It's beseeching and commanding. What is beseeching? Okay, um, there are 24 references uh, where Paul beseeches people. You know, Paul writing most of his letters, it is written to correct people, right? Um, he used it to correct people, to bring about correction uh, in the churches. So what is, and he uses uh, beseeching 24 uh, times. There's a reference for beseeching 24 times in Paul's epistles. Uh, beseech means um, to call near, uh, to invite, to exhort, to pray, um, request, to ask, uh, you know. So basically, it's more like, you know, requesting, exhorting, telling them, inviting them to understand, to change, uh, you know, and praying for um, them, okay. So uh, in various exam uh, uh, references where Paul is, you know, correcting people uh, when he's writing his letters to various churches, he uses this word beseech to correct them. That means he's saying, hey, you know, I'm calling you near. It's a personal thing, inviting you. You know, I'm praying that you would understand, that you'd correct yourself, that you would uh, change, okay. Now command, uh, Paul uses it very sparingly, only four times he uses it, okay. Um, and he uses it in the sense of using uh, his spiritual authority, okay. Uh, his uh, uh, When he requires people to follow what God is asking them to uh, do okay so there are a few times when he uses this and one of the times is in um, in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 he says now to the married i command you know uh, and he's not saying i'm doing it but he's saying god is commanding you okay and then in second thessalonians chapter 3 uh, verses 4, uh, 6, and uh, 12, where he's commanding the brethren in the name of Jesus Christ to withdraw from this brother who is not living an orderly life uh, according to the traditions that they have received. Okay, so uh, it's important that we command them. The command is basically more coming from a uh, more, uh, you know, uh, from God's. Uh, what God is telling us to command. I say, you know, uh, even as I'm correcting you, I like you to, to see what God is commanding us in his word. So that is how we can phrase it or word it when we are telling people, okay? Now, when people, uh, we correct them, you know, they um, we can receive uh, various kind of reactions from them, okay? Um, some of them can very immaturely react um, they can complain all these times, you know, they were very nice with you. They were listening. They were very loving, speaking nicely to you. Suddenly when you correct them, they're complaining about anything and everything. Okay. Anything and everything about you, they're complaining and every little thing of the past, you know, they bring it in the front and they make it a big, um, issue. And, uh, you know, they, um, uh, and everything that you do towards them, it looks like as if to say, you know, they feel that you're putting them down or you're restricting them, you're controlling them and you're hurting them. Okay. Or uh, some of them even withdraw, you know, they go away from, they don't speak to you uh, when you are, uh, when you're passing them, they will look up in the other direction or they will walk away, you know, uh, so they don't want to have any interactions. Uh, sometimes people can retaliate, you know, uh, they blame you you know, for the problems, for their disappointments, for their dissatisfaction. Uh, and sometimes they can even departure, depart from you. They can leave your church, your ministry, your organization, your life group, your Bible study group, prayer group. Okay, so what should you do in such situations? In such situations, you need to don't take offense, guard your heart. Okay, 
uh, look at what Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. Galatia. You know, the church at Galatia, Paul had labored, he had taught them, and suddenly there was this person who was coming and teaching them that, you know, hey, you have to follow all these uh, Old Testament Jewish rituals of food, of circumcision, and doing these rituals and that rituals. And all of them in the church were trying to do that. And when Paul heard about it, he was very, very uh, uh, sad. He was very uh, disappointed. He said, you know, he says, I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored in you in, with you in vain. But what does he say in verse 13? He says, but you have not injured me at all. See, he does not take it personal. He guards his heart. He's done what he's supposed to do. And if people are not adhering to um, the doctrines of Jesus Christ, there's nothing he can do. He says, hey, you've not injured me at all. Okay. Uh, the next thing we can do is give time for people to change. You know, people need time. They need time to think about it, you know, to process things in their minds. If they're hurt, give them time, you know. And, um, you know, if they want to move out, go, let them go away in peace. Send them out in peace. But maintain a good relationship with them. Uh, when they come back, speak to them, help them out in, uh, in areas that you can uh, do to help and strengthen them and build them. Okay. The seventh thing is that uh, bring maturity in all areas. Okay. A goal in building people in the spirit is to help people uh, develop to be mature in every area of their lives. Okay. Uh, remember in the previous chapter, we talked about spiritual maturity, right? And we talked about spiritual maturity is growing into Christ likeness. When are we complete? We are complete or uh, we are perfect, teleos, perfect, when we, in all things, in all areas, we grow to be like um, Jesus Christ, okay? So, um, and um, is it possible to grow in all areas to be like Jesus Christ, at least to be like Jesus Christ? Yes, how do we do that? The Holy Spirit and the Word, okay? So, the Holy Spirit and the Word, okay? So um, sometimes we um, mistake or emphasize maturity in our giftings and callings and forget that character is more important, okay? So we need to, God is more interested in our character, okay? So we need to deal with our character issues, okay? How do we uh, deal with our character issues? Learn to relate with people apart from their gift, Okay, some people can cover their character with their gifts and their callings. And we don't know some of their personal sins that they are involved in. You will not know what some of my personal um, sins that I'm involved in. I can have the name or a title. I can uh, be in ministry for so many years. I can be teaching you. But, you know, I can also fool you with some of my personal sins. So, uh, you know, don't uh, just look at people with their gifts and callings. Uh, but, you know, and neglect their character um, issues, okay? Deal with heart issues. If people have heart issues like rejection, insecurities, rebellion, uh, which is seen outwardly, you know, we need to help people, okay, with that. Uh, deal with um, uh, issues like people's short temper. No, they're not able to relate with other people, always gossiping about others, always laughing about others, always complaining, cribbing about others. Okay, and also independence. Some people want to do things their way. You know, you give them a role, a responsibility, There's, and you ask them, why did you do it this way? I told you to do it this way. They said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit guided me. It's actually, it's not just the Holy Spirit. It's actually their own, they want to, uh, you know, do things in their own independence, way they feel comfortable, the way they like, where they think is right. And so you need to help people, you know, teach them that they need to come under leadership and under the vision and the mission uh, of the organization that they are in okay deal with lifestyle um, habits okay um, like it's important for people to maintain a good testimony how they manage their family their uh, their money their um, uh, assets uh, their job and all of those things okay um, also break uh, identify and break cycles of failure now sometimes people can be running in and out of ministries and churches you know so we need to help people even deal with that uh, you know so 
uh, identify those areas and also help them in those areas. Okay. The eighth one is release them into their calling. When people have a specific calling, they grow and mature with you. You've seen the gifts, uh, the function, the grace that is upon them, you know, and then release them into their calling. Live, give them the liberty to do things on their own, just like Paul did with Titus and Timothy. You know, Titus, the Timothy was a son in the faith who he mentored. Okay, and we see that he does not keep Timothy alive long as his son. But we see that Paul, you know, at one point of time, he says, my son in the faith. But later on, he says, Timothy, who's my co-worker, my co-laborer, uh, you know, my co-worker in the kingdom of God. So we see how Paul moves on from just keeping him as his son to moving him to a place of looking at him as a mature person in a leadership role. And he leaves him in a very strategic place in the city of Ephesus, where Paul, has, Timothy has to oversee many churches around uh, uh, Ephesus as well. The seven churches that is in Revelation, you know, is around Ephesus. And so even Timothy had responsibility. So over those churches. And why does Paul leave him there in such a strategic, important responsibility as a young man? Because he sees him grow up to that capability of being spiritually mature to be able to take leadership. And Paul does not say, hey, he's my son. I'll keep him with me. Let him journey with me. He leaves him there and he teaches him to take on that responsibility. So also with Titus, who he leaves in Crete. Okay. Um, so we need to release people into their calling and not just keep them under us, you know, doing things for us. Like as to say, we are uh, kings and they are our servants and our subjects who need to always uh, take care of our needs. Okay. Continue to be their spiritual support even when needed. Okay. So even when you release people, continue to mentor them, support them, build them up, just like Paul did for Timothy and Titus. Okay. He writes two letters to Timothy, first and second Timothy, when he was in Roman imprisonment. Okay. And he writes even to Titus. Okay. So important that we continue to support them. Uh, and if, uh, you know, if people fall down, um, uh, restore them, you know, with gentleness, give them spiritual restoration. Um, um, you know, uh, don't uh, make a fun or a mockery of, uh, you know, their sins or their, uh, you know, falling or, uh, you know, how they have fallen. Say, how could you do this and all of those things and expel them from the church and expel them from the ministry. That's not going to help the person. Okay, Restore those who are fallen and handle those who are, um, uh, you know, handling also those who are fallen away. So like we see, you know, Paul uses discernment. When some people fall away from the truth, he he helps to restore them. But some of them, like, you know, who shipwreck their faith, like uh, we see in, he writes to Philemon, you know, he talks about um, uh, 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 Aristarchus and Demas. And he also talks about uh, to Timothy, he's writing Second Timothy about Demas, he says, who has loved the present world and he has, you know, forsaken Christ, forsaken the ministry. And uh, he also talks about uh, uh, to Timothy about First Timothy uh, chapter one about Hymenius and Alexander who have shipwrecked their faith. And what does Paul say? I have delivered them to whom? Satan. You know, when you read these words, you can say how 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 cruel of Paul to you know say that you know, I've given them up to Satan. What does Paul really mean when he's in two occasions, okay, here and the church at Corinth, you know, one man was living an immoral lifestyle. He says, you know, hand him over to Satan. Send him out of the church and hand him over to Satan. So what does Paul really mean? He's saying these men are men who are in leadership positions, authority. They have known Christ. They have tasted Christ. They have experienced Christ. And we have helped them to overcome but in spite of that what has happened they are not willing to overcome their sin and so he says send them out of the church or the fellowship or hand them over to satan which means he's saying that you know when they are out of the spiritual covering satan attacks them they go through various problems and difficulties and what happens then they are mindful of their sin and they can repent and come back. And when you come, then they come back in one case, Paul says, you know, in the church of Corinth, he says, bring, take back that person. Okay. So that is why he says, hand them over to Satan. Not that they are 
destroyed and land in hell for the rest of their lives, but so that they can learn a lesson and they can, you know, it can become a recovery and they can come back and, uh, uh, you know, they can be restored. So two different ways he does that. Sometimes we can restore people who have fallen. Sometimes, you know, we just um, send them away so that they learn and then, you know, God can work in their lives and the Holy Spirit ultimately can work and uh, restore them. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, we will end class. And just like I had, um, uh, you know, posted in the uh, Google Classroom, you will have your assessment on Wednesday, right? November 8th. And you can submit it on November 10th. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Have a blessed day and a blessed week. Thank you. Oh, I didn't ask Sri Radha if... Uh, Sri Radha, is your question answered?